Thanks for allowing me to be here. It's my pleasure to be here. I have uh, one disclosure. I'm uh, currently a post-market research investigator for Valencia, one of the uh, tibial, tibial nerve stimulators that I will be talking about. McGuire and colleagues were actually the first to actually utilize electrical stimulation to treat bladder dysfunction. It was back in 1983, and they took the, their point of stimulation based on old Chinese acupuncture medicine, and the site was uh, just above the ankle to treat various uh, bladder ailments. They applied transcutaneous electrical stimulation to different patient populations, and des described a few case reports of clinical improvement in patients with overactive bladder, interstitial cystitis, and even spinal cord injury. It, they, it did appear to require continuous stimulation to actually achieve the effect. When the stimulation was turned off, they, they lost their effect. And they uh, actually showed a chart where 19 of 22 patients, actually they documented benefit with various bladder disorders. And then Stoller and colleagues kind of built on that with development of the, of the Stoller afferent nerve stimulator in 1987. And what they did was they studied potential peripheral sites for neuromodulation of the sacral cord. They looked for different areas of high impedance within the skin in the S2, S3 dermatomes, and they identified a site just above the medial malleolus at the level of the tibial nerve. And this uh, is uh, the uh, location, they call it spleen six acupuncture point, which is also the same location used by traditional Chinese medicine to treat bladder disorders. So the uh, actually, the needle placement and stimulation paradigms used by Stoller were actually the basis for future PTNS trials and an eventual FDA approval. So they really laid the groundwork for future trials. As far as how does neuromodulation work for bladder dysfunction, it's unknown. No one really knows the mechanisms behind it. The tibial nerve is a mixed sensory motor nerve arising from the L4 to S3 nerve roots. And there's some suggestion that the mechanisms may be different between tibial nerve stimulation and sacral neuromodulation. For one thing, patients that undergo PTNS usually undergo weekly sessions for 12 weeks, and that the, the benefit of treatment can actually last longer than that because then they go to monthly maintenance. Whereas with sacral neuromodulation, it's more of a continuous treatment, and usually when the stimulation is turned off, patients have a return of symptoms within a few days. In addition, there have been you know, anecdotal reports of patients that have failed sacral neuromodulation, that have done well with PTNS or even the implantable tibial nerve stimulation devices and vice versa. You know, as far as what mechanisms may be involved with tibial nerve stimulation and how it suppresses detrusor overactivity, some studies in cats have suggested that one mechanism may be an opioid receptor activation at the level of either the, the PAG, the periaqueductal gray, or the Ponte Micturition Center. The real impetus for the FDA approval was this summit trial, which was really the first neuromodulation trial that involved a validated sham component. So it was 220 patients, 110 patients got the PTNS stimulation, and the other 110 patients got a sham stimulation. And they showed that there was a significant difference or greater improvement in the global response assessment in the PTNS group uh, versus the sham. They followed this with the STEP trial, which was really a three-year extension trial. So all the patients that did well with a 12-week stimulation, not, not all of them, but a certain proportion, entered the STEP trial. And 29 patients completed the 36 months, and they used various models to account for the you know, the, the large dropout, but they stated that 75% of patients that did well with 12 weeks of stimulation continued to see improvement at 36 weeks. The problem with the PTNS, as, with, as, as well as with other therapies, is really compliance. So this is a retrospective real-world study of, large study, 163 patients uh, that underwent PTNS treatment. 81% of patients that finished the trial went into monthly maintenance but less than 40% continued after one year. And there was various reasons for this. The most common reasons were either worsening symptoms or lack of efficacy, or just the time commitment required to continue therapy. And that really was the impetus for development of this implantable tibial nerve stimulators. It was really patient-based logistical constraints of the multiple office visits, perhaps 
maybe lack of, uh, you know, reduced efficacy could be a reason. But there was also secondary factors, physician-based. You know, that it really it can be a poor resource utilization for certain clinics, tying up a clinic room for, you know, 30-minute treatment sessions with poor, you know, reimbursement. And there were some insurance-based factors where, you know, at least under Medicare, there's a 45-month or 45-treatment maximum uh, lifetime reimbursement. You know, although this is a, a considered a retired policy, you know, Medicare could do an audit of that, of that policy, so that could be a factor. So the first implantable tibial nerve stimulation device that was FDA approved was the eCoin, and that was in March 2022 for urge urinary incontinence. It's about the size of a nickel itself, that's why they call it eCoin, and it's implanted under a minimally invasive local anesthesia. It delivers automated therapy, and no remote is required for patient usage. So it, it really delivers, uh, it's, it's leadless, so it has a battery with a ring electrode within it, and it delivers a, a pretty generous dome-like field of stimulation that really leads to re reproducible results and re really forgivable placement. Now, I've actually been involved with implanting five of these so far as part of the post-market trial. They have a template that guides in the incision and actually the battery placement. It's done under local anesthesia within the office. It's, it's an above fascia placement, so all you have to do is subcutaneous dissection, you place the battery, but they do recommend a three-layer closure. It was designed by a, actually a plastic surgeon to minimize wound complications. And this was the prospective trial in 132 patients that really led to FDA approval. All patients had to stop overactive bladder, bladder medications before entering the trial. And they demonstrated that 68% of patients had greater than 50% reduction in urge incontinence episodes at 48 weeks. There was a 19% adverse event rate. 5% of patients had pain uh, with stimulation at 52 weeks. And there was a 2.25% uh, explant rate related to infection. So three patients had explants of the uh, 132 related to that. And most recently, they published an extension trial where 72 patients continued on for two further years. So it was total three years duration uh, in entirety. Patients could go on overactive bladder medicine, but most didn't. 91% of patients stayed off overactive bladder medications. They showed that at the end of the uh, three years or two years extension, that 78% of patients continue to have a greater than 50% reduction in urge incontinence episodes. 22% of patients were completely dry, and there was only two additional adverse events. One patient had pain in an extremity, and then one patient had a delayed wound dehiscence between 48 and 96 weeks that was treated conservative, conservatively. And then the uh, Revy device is the second FDA-approved implantable device. This was approved by the FDA in August of 2023 for urgent, urge incontinence and with or without urinary urgency. This is a, a battery-free miniature device that is implant, implanted as a single procedure under local anesthesia. It does require, it's a subfascial, so it does require opening of the fascia, but this allows for a direct visualization of the tibial nerve, and it's anchored to the fascia itself to prevent any electromigration. It is patient-centric in the sense that patients control the timing, duration, and even the quality of stimulation through this external wearable power source. Similar to the eCoin, it does have a template that aids in the uh, incision and placement, but as stated, it is subfascial, so it does require, you know, opening of the fascia, uh, which does allow for, you know, identification of the nerve and, and more precise placement and anchoring of the electrode itself. This was the prospective trial that actually uh, led to FDA approval. It was 151 women with urge urinary incontinence with a mean of 4.8 urge incontinence episodes per day. As opposed to the eCoin trial, 35% of these patients were still on overactive bladder med medication during the trial. They did show significant improvement, a greater than 50% reduction at one month. And this improvement continued up to a year. So you can see that the 50, greater than 50% improvement bar increases so that 82% actually showed a greater than 50% reduction at one year, and actually 50% of patients were dry at one year, so it was pretty significant. They did have 4% of patients complained of discomfort with stimulation at one year, and there was a 10.6%
complication related to the procedure. The most were related to wounds. 6.6% .6 of patients had some wound issues, but there was no, they were all managed conservatively. There was no, no explants recorded from the trial. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the third, the, the third implant. It's not FDA approved. It's a Medtronic device called a Titan that hasn't received approval. They finished the clinical trial. They're awaiting approval now. Uh, but uh, it is a, a leadless pulse generator that, uh, that stimulates the tibial nerve. It's similar to the eCoin in that it's an uh, it's, uh, it's a implant that contains both the battery and electrodes, and it's placed above the fascia. This article describes the Titan One study, which was a feasibility trial, which actually demonstrated that the implant could deliver uh, illicit, uh, reliable, low amplitude sensory and motor responses uh, up to 14 days post implant. And from that, they designed the Titan Two trial, which was actually the clinical trial. And based on this, they they talked that, talked about that patients would be activated within 24 hours of implant, that they would receive stimulation every other day for 30 minutes, and that the primary endpoint would be the percentage of patients with greater than 50% reduction in urge incontinence episodes at six months. So we're just kind of waiting the final clinical results of that study. Currently, as far as reimbursement for the two FDA-approved implants, there's a category three CPT code, 0186T for anything above fascia, so that would be the ecoin, and 0817T descriptor for below fascia, which would be the Revy. There's a, but this doesn't actually assign any payment level, so you have to add some kind of comparator code that, that, uh, to try to get some kind of reimbursement. Some will uh, use like a battery, a pulse generator implant, some will use a lead implant, some will even use a sling procedure just based on the amount of time or complexity related to the procedure. So there's no defined comparator code to use that's kind of up to your discretion but uh, they, they estimate that they will get a Category 1 code probably maybe in January of 2020, 2026. So it's still a little ways off. So based on that, who, who would I say would be a good tibial nerve stimulator candidate? Well, anybody with you know, urge incontinence, anyone who's failed conservative therapy, obviously prior success with PTNS would be ideal, although it's not a prerequisite. And then you know, patients in whom... Botox or sacral nerve modulation may not be a good option if you're worried about, you know, anesthesia risk with sacral nerve modulation or risk for need for catheterization with Botox, then, then, they, then this may be a good option as well. Poor candidates, anyone with nerve damage or neuropathy where they really wouldn't expect them to get a necessarily good treatment effect from it. Uh, anyone with open wounds or sores on the lower extremity, if they've had prior surgery or trauma in that area, a severe pitting edema, and uh, any kind of severe, you know, venous insufficiency or arterial insufficiency that could, uh, you know, compromise wound healing. I kind of just put this slide together because, you know, eventually if we have these three, it's going to be like, which one, which one to choose? Because now you have three different things, you know, what's the differences between them? So I tried to summarize maybe some differences that, that I see at least with it. I think for eCoin, you know, advantage would be it's office-based. It's, it's really hassle-free. So for that patient who doesn't you want to have anything to do with it. They just want automated therapy. They don't need a remote to, to change any stimulation parameters. They don't want to wear any kind of you know, boot around the ankle. That, that would be a great choice for them. Disadvantages could be multiple procedures. You know, right now, the, the battery life can range anywhere from one year to, they, they estimate you know, with newer gener generations up to six years. So you may have to do multiple procedures to, to change that out. And there is uh, issues, at least with the current model, with some stimulation drift, which isn't a lot. It's about three to five minutes per treatment session. But if you look over 18 weeks, that could go up to 3.5 hours. And I've had one patient who was actually bothered because it actually came on while he was asleep. And it, you know, it bothered him, you know, doing that. And that was all due to the stimulation drift. And I can kind of reprogram these things, but uh, without having any kind of patient control at this point, you know, it, it could be an issue. The Revy, you know, advantage, it's a single procedure. You know, you place the electrode in place, you suture it in place, you shouldn't have any issues with migration. Uh, it, it's a fixed device, you get to uh, actually see the nerve, so there is maybe more precise placement, and, uh, and it's patient-centric. So patients that really want to control you know, when they deliver the stimulation and how they do it and the different quality, someone who likes that, it would be a great choice. Disadvantages, it's subfascial. So, you know, this, this question if you know they they anticipate it could be done in an office uh, in an office but is questions would this you know would someone really feel comfortable doing a subfascial dissection 
you know, in the office. Uh, and there's always potential risk for neurovascular compromise, although it wasn't described in the trial. And then, you know, it could be cumbersome. You know, patients had to treat for general 30 to 60 minutes per session, twice daily. You know, that could eventually be, you know, cumbersome for some patients or, or wouldn't be a good choice for some. And then the Titan, you know, we don't really have the, the final results of the trial, but based on what I know, it, it would be an office-based procedure. They talked about, at least in the trial design, rapid onset of therapy, you know, within 24 hours of implant, as opposed to, you know, the equoin, they talk about, you know, letting the site heal for two to four weeks before you actually activate it, and then the Revy for four weeks. So there would be, a, at least based on these, a little a quicker onset of therapy with this device. Disadvantages could be, it would be, a, it's a rechargeable device. Now, supposedly the batteries last 15 years, but the patients have to recharge. And we know from, you know, prior, you know, sacral neuromodulation rechargeable devices, as well as pain rechargeable devices, that there can be issues with compliance over the long time with patients, you know, maintaining and wearing these little belts to, to uh, continue to, to uh, charge it. So I think, you know, there, there are some advantages or disadvantages to each. Some are going to be physician, you know, and some are going to be patient-based to decide which would be the best. One, one of the real questions we have now is, is it going to really make a big impact on the number of patients that actually progress the third-line therapy? Because currently, the rates are pretty low, anywhere from, you know, 1 to 3 to 4 percent. This was a study that actually examined in women the trends in progression to these, you know, advanced OAB options from 2010 to 2019. And you can see, you know, 2010 was when PTNS became FDA approved. 2013 was when BOTAS became approved. And although there's some increases in both, the overall actual utilization or progression remained low, about 1% in the study. So there wasn't really any change in the amount of patients that progressed, maybe a little change in the, in the, the different ratios of each procedure. And then more recently, uh, that came out this year, they looked at the AQA, AQUA registry which was first developed in 2014, and they, they found that the progression rates were really remain low, about 3% from second line to third line therapy, from medication to these advanced OAB options, that the median time to progression was 15.4 months, so over a year to progress, and that, uh, you know, PTNS was most common amongst men and those older than 80. Now, the progression rates were faster in subspecialists, patients that, I mean, providers that actually perform these advanced OAB procedures, it was about 10 to 14 percent. So part of it is, you know, getting these patients to the advanced OAB providers at an earlier time point. I think one impetus that can help with that is actually the, the changes within the new AUA SUFU guidelines for OAB. In the past, they had, you know, different, they had first line, second line, third line therapies where the first line was kind of behavioral treatment, second line was pharmacotherapy, and then third line was these advanced OAB options. So based on that, patients had to kind of progress through each step before they got to it. Now with these, these this new guidelines, they don't use those categories. They have what they call non-invasive therapy, pharmacotherapy, and then minimally invasive therapy. And they actually make that statement down below there in that, that red to highlight where they say that patients can be advanced to minimally invasive therapy without having tried either or tried or failed or even tried behavioral therapy or even pharmacotherapy. Now, that's a big statement, and I think they're trying to, to, to uh, kind of push the patients into some of these minimally invasive therapies, um, particularly given the fact that a lot of pharmacotherapy is expensive or there could be side effects. I think, you know, under a current climate, insurance, you know, companies are going to still require to probably do a medication trial, but my hope is in the future that, that uh, these guidelines will help kind of be an impetus to, to help, you know, primary care providers or non-specialist urologists you know, refer patients to specialized urologists and hopefully even insurance companies will allow some of these minimally evasion options at an earlier time point so that we can really uh, tailor treatments to a, a patient's individual needs. And with that, I think I'll end here and uh, I think we'll take questions after Shyam's talk. Thank you. Thank you.